In the Madeleine Corbell Albright Institute's 15th anniversary year, we are so proud to celebrate our 600 alum fellows who span the globe. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Maddie Talks 2024. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it make any sound? I'd like to take you on a walk today through the forest of Netherlandish art history. It's a subject I've been studying since 2016 with a special focus on the Dutch 20th century painter, Pijk Koch. Now, I would be shocked if anyone in this room today had heard of Pijk Koch before. Outside of the Netherlands, he is virtually unknown. But I assure you that within the forest of 20th century Dutch painting, he is quite a big tree. Pike Koch was born in 1901. He died in 1991. His paintings hang in major museums across the Netherlands and Belgium. The last painting of his to be sold at auction at Sotheby's in London in 2020 went for over 500,000 pounds. I remember when I first came across his work and I asked my professor what he thought of him. He said to me, Pike Koch, he was a fascist, he was a Nazi, he was wrong in the war. Nevertheless, he is one of the Netherlands' greatest painters. This seeming contradiction between good and bad, admired aesthetics and reviled morals lies at the core of not only my interest in Pike Kolk, but also why I believe he is so revered and yet still so unknown. Pike Kolk's politics are controversial in the Netherlands, its relationship to his art even more so. The predominant view continues to be that his politics had zero or only incidental influence on his art. My dissertation argues against this view. My research has convinced me that Pike Koch aspired to be recognized as the Netherlands' greatest national socialist painter under the Third Reich. Once we accept this as a possibility, ideas relating to this aspiration pop up in his oeuvre from the 1920s through to the 1980s, and we begin to understand Pike Koch more as a member of an international community of artists for whom fascism and national socialism form an indelible part of their artistry, from France's Louis Ferdinand Céline to America's own Ezra Pound. But Pike Koch has not yet been recognized as a member of this community because so much of the context surrounding his paintings, in other words, our ability to hear the sound they are making, has been lost. Current museum trends which favor participatory and inclusive exhibition approaches over historic ones have deafened our ears to the context we need to understand many of these paintings. So let's visit one of these museums, the Koninklijk Museum for Schone Kunsten in Antwerp, a world-renowned collection which recently reopened in September 2022 after a 100 million euro renovation. It made headlines around the globe for the innovative way they reorganized their permanent collection, not according to history and geography, but according to themes. What does that mean? Well, right now we're looking in the horizons room. At the center, you see not an artwork, but a playground structure that children can play on and climb on as their parents gaze upon artwork spanning over five centuries and many different nations. The only thing they have in common is that they have a horizon. Pike Koch's painting, Het Uur U, in English, H Hour, hangs presiding over the playground to the far left in the back. So the room tells us that this painting has a horizon. The placard doesn't tell us much more besides the name, the name of the artist and the date it was made, 1971. This is the third version of this painting Pike Koch made, the first in 1958, the second in 1964. So let's look at the painting. We see two bodies lying on the ground in the foreground on what looks like a potholed golf course. In the background, we see a mountainscape, a sky at either dawn or dusk, and multicolored parachutes falling to the ground. If we were to look closer, we would see tanks, people, and bicycles attached to these parachutes. So let's say we want to exhaust the museum's resources. What can they tell us about this painting? We go to their website, we look at the object description. This is what we read. At home, the talk was mainly about the Cold War. My father was a cold warrior, very anti-Russian, according to Peter Kolk, the artist's son. So already we have a bit of a problem because the only source this object description cites is the artist's son, a diplomat and five-time ambassador who has his own political reputation to think about. Now, Ambassador Kolk is a priceless source on the artist. However, is it appropriate for an object description on a museum website to use him as their exclusive source? Not in my opinion. 
Nevertheless, the object description continues, and based on this only source, they declare unequivocally that this painting shows a Russian attack. They then tell us that it's an unreal scene derived from Pike Kolk's anti-Russian sentiment and imagination. To me, this sounds less like information and more like noise distracting us from the authentic sound that Pike Kolk is trying to make. So let's try to figure this out on our own. Beginning with the title, H hour is a military term for hour of attack, like D Day, the day of attack. When we think of D Day, we think of World War II, June 6, 1944, the Allied invasion of Normandy, and the subsequent Allied operations to liberate Nazi occupied territories. Pike Kolk never gave his painting superfluous titles, and the idea that he would have given this painting a military title without considering associations to World War II seems rather far fetched to me. The parachutes he paints resemble images of Allied forces dropping into Nijmegen for Operation Market Garden, the Allied operation to liberate Nazi, the Netherlands from Nazi Germany. This operation was a failure for the Allies and a relative success for the 9th and 10th SS Panzer divisions. They also resemble in their multicolors descriptions from veterans of the multicolored parachutes resembling a large flower with insects crawling over it. The mountains give the painting a precise location. This is a 19th century well-circulated engraving of the village of Bake near Nijmegen and a stone's throw from the German border. In the background to the far left we see Mount Elton and to the right we see this peculiar double humped mountain ridge. Now in Pike Hulk's painting these are closer to the foreground and that's probably because his painting is in the valley, that is to say in the village of Bake as opposed to looking down upon it. Now, why would Pike Kolk paint a village, a painting of Bake? Well, Pike Kolk was born in Bake. He grew up there. He died longing to return there. And the Battle of Bake was an important part of Operation Market Garden. It was fought between the Americans and the Germans from September 18th to September 21st. The Americans incurred significant losses. They retreated. They came back. They destroyed the center of Bake. They failed to liberate it. It remained in German hands until February 1945. Now this painting is beginning to look much less like an unreal Russian invasion and much more like a very real American invasion. So the question remains, was Pike Kolk mourning an allied loss or was he commemorating an Axis victory? Well, the painting doesn't give us a clear answer, but Pike Kolk's words can point us in one direction. You know how pessimistic I always have been, he wrote in a private letter in 1980. As a matter of fact, since the annihilation of the only strong nation state on this continent in 1945. So, with the exception of this last quote, all of the information I've used to interpret this painting is publicly available. So why did the museum not provide us with it? Is it not important? Is it not relevant? Last year, Geert Wilder's far-right Freedom Party won a majority of seats in Dutch Parliament in a landslide victory. As Americans were in 2016, many Dutch people were surprised by this result, but they shouldn't have been. The Freedom Party has been among the three largest parties in the Netherlands since 2010. So why were Americans surprised then and Dutch surprised now? Perhaps for the same reason, Visitors are walking through the Horizons Room in Antwerp, oblivious to the fact that a painting quite possibly commemorating a Nazi victory is presiding over their children's playground. Institutions which once committed themselves to educating and informing their public, to teaching them to listen for falling trees, have abandoned their posts in order to entertain, befriend, and appease. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it make any sound? The answer should be obvious, yes. The question I'd like to leave you with today is, when will we and when will our institutions stop entertaining this question? Thank you.